we're here to talk about this cool thing, recording that BSE for RISC-V. Okay. We just did a show of hands. Everybody had heard of both these things. Yeah, so I'm super excited. I picked the right audience this time. It's going to go better. So quick overview, quick introduction to these things, although everyone says they know these things, so that shouldn't be too important. Uh, we're going to do it in the simulators, the tool chains, the build scripts, and all the horrible nonsense that I dealt with. Um, and then the moving target that is a not quite complete chip, and how that changed. Uh, deal with the virtual memory system, and the fun of that changing. And then PMAP Common, which was there to solve problems, but made it worse. And then where we stand today, and then things that I actually want to get done in the future, hopefully the very near future. I, I deal with it. So, because you all know this stuff, right? That BSD, fast, free, secure. It's that last one, a highly portable Unix-like operating system, right? That's the big key, right? Highly portable. We do all the things. Excuse me, mm -hmm. you have to correct that slide. It's a highly portable Unix operating source operating system. It's not Unix-like, it is Unix. It's not licensed Unix, though. It's Unix, right? It's not, it's not certified Unix. So, I'm going to say my Unix like I don't want the Unix working group to come sue me. Also, I think this actually came from the NetBSD website. I'm fairly certain that line was a copy paste. Do you have an explanation? What's that? Do you have an explanation? Yeah, the slide is saying why couldn't get the solution. So, we were started in 1993. Happy 25th to us, right? We've been going for a while. <coughs> Um, I'm actually a new NetBSD developer. I got my commitment just last month. I'm, I'm kind of new to this whole thing. It's been really awesome. Everybody's been really welcoming. Uh, Phil over here, Phil was my research advisor for my graduate research project. Uh, he was NetBSD developer number six. He contributed to PC <coughs> back when it was the like build your own computer system, do the whole thing yourself. Um, and he's currently working on pulling the FreeBSD Wi Fi stack into NetBSD. So he's going to give us some new Wi Fi. Which would be fantastic. I'd like to go beyond 802.11g at some point. That seems reasonable. Um, as of the time I put these slides together, and I checked it a couple of months ago, we run on 57 different platforms and 16 different types of CPUs. Right? You got your covered, man. We can do it. Including a toaster. We'll get there. So, it's going to be PSD platforms, right? Here we have our RMB6, our AMD64, our i386, right? Your standard things you see quite a bit these days. There's your Raspberry Pi plug and the monitor up here. Got your AMD64 desktop, old i386 laptop. Got the Pi plug. I actually brought my Pi book with me. It's fun, right? Cool little ARM64 laptop that's like 100 bucks. Fun little toy. There's the old HP Jornada 690, right? Palm top computing, because that was going to be a big thing. But we run on that. The Atari TT-03, old M68K, still got that. This is where I got into the NetBSD stuff, is the Dreamcast. Right? I had a video game console I wasn't playing games on, but I could still learn Unix on it. Right? I learned how to set up NFS and how to mount stuff and run NetBSD on a Dreamcast. Because, why not, <coughs> right? Dumb things. There's the W03. There's a cell phone that runs NetBSD. Like, there's actually just X running on this thing. I don't know if it's big enough here, but there's an X term that you can't read. You definitely make out the X size at least, though. And then there's the Mac station, because it still runs on that. I would believe we have a talk tomorrow. Right? Maybe you can make the Nyan cat appear. Probably not. Probably not. Um, <laughs> someone did. And that's all that matters. And then, of course, there's our toast. Right? Our glorious toaster. Because we did it. But then last year, we did it again. Someone made a new thing called Iron Forge Color Screen. There's our second toaster. I'm waiting for somebody to step up the game. I think someone needs to do like a coffee pot next. We need to continue in the realm of appliances and other dumb platforms. Or a sandwich maker since you like toasters. There you go. So, you know, I figure, like, why not one more, right? What's one more platform? We'll just throw it in the mix, nobody will even notice. So that's pretty much why I did all the work, right? Just dumb fun, let's keep going. So, the RISC-V itself, 
originally developed at UC Berkeley in 2010 as a teaching example, right? It was only there to teach a class. It wasn't meant to be production hardware. It wasn't meant to be anything more than just a research and education. Um, people wound up asking for it and saying, hey, can we use this? This is kind of cool. And it kind of just continued expanding and expanding. People actually contributed back, and it kind of grew from there. Um, it is a free and open source ISA, but only the ISA is free and open source, right? It's not a free chip. I know you're thinking there actually are free implementations of the chip, but that's not part of what the RISC-V Foundation does. The RISC-V Foundation only defines the ISA, the instruction set that it runs, and that's it. But there are totally open versions of the chip running that ISA. So, still fairly cool. Um, and the RISC-V Foundation is this small group of companies. They're not, they're not too big, so you might ask like, who they are. These are some teeny tiny companies. You might not have heard of them. They're not wildly successful. Maybe someday, right? Everybody's got to grow at some point. These, these tiny companies are currently steering the future of open computing, um, which is pretty sweet. Seems like they're doing an okay job so far. So as it stands now, we actually have multiple specifications for the RISC-V. There's the standard RISC-V ISA, and there's the privileged ISA. And the RISC-V ISA actually has other specifications as a part of it. So there's RB32I, which is your standard 32-bit set. There's RB32E, which is the embedded set. There's RB64I, which is our 64-bit standard. There is no RB64E. So if you want to do embedded, no 64-bit, at least not now. And they have RB128I. Seriously, yes, sir. What does the embedded mean? So the, the, so the embedded actually has half the this many registers. So it has 16 registers instead of 32, um, and all the instructions are not the same. There, so some of the standard base instructions that are part of I are part of E, but not all of them. Yes? You don't actually have to have the privileged ISA at all. That's not a requirement for the chip. And so at this point, nobody has built an E that actually supports the privileged ISA. I mean, if you're in the embedded space, maybe you're not as worried about memory management in the virtual memory system, perhaps? Okay. Um, as of right now, the work we did, NetBSD is targeting RD64 GSU, which is cool and a mouthful, but it gets bigger. Technically, that expands out to RD64 I and AFD SU. <laughs> and in that order, because order matters. I don't know why it's that alphabetic. And at some point, we'd kind of like to roll back to the RV32 GSU because 32 bits still a thing. Maybe somebody will actually want one. So, all these letters have meaning, right? They are defined standard extensions in the RISC V world. So, our A, and all our color coded stuff is the things we're targeting, our A is the atomic instructions, um, the D is the double precision, F is the single precision, I is the base integer set, right? That's the 32, the 64. Um, that's going to give us our, our 32 registers. Our end is linear to multiplication and division because, yes, you can have a chip without that. It's not a requirement. Um, the S is the supervisor and the U is the user mode. So the supervisor and the user mode are actually what give us virtual memory. That's how we get our protections in place. And again, that's part of the privilege spec, and you don't have to have it. So not all RISC fives will just natively run a Unix variant, unfortunately. Um, but they do have some cool stuff that they've started working on. Right? There's the uh, transactional memory, there's the vector operations, there's the queue for quad precision floating point. You're like, I want to do crazy math. That's it. What happens when they add another feature? Because they seem to have run out of leverage. So that's the Y and the Z. <laughs> Those are going to non standard things, right? But you can actually probe the registers in boot up time and you can figure out what you have. So if you can strain yourself to be a you obviously can shake it. Yeah. Unix can't because we don't run an end mode until I read the stupid thing. Yeah. Not quite there yet, but yes. So, let's actually start doing some real work here, right? Now that we know what these things are, let's let's build a thing. Let's do the port. So, I did all of my work in spite. This is what the RISC-V Foundation put out. It is the simulator to run RISC-V, right? It basically just boots up and just runs RISC-V code on just about anything. It's pretty cross-platform. Um, you feed it a RISC-V binary and it just runs until it stops, or if you're in a loop, it just runs forever. 
but it doesn't actually have any services. There's no BIOS or UDFI provided inside. There's no way to really do anything. Um, you actually need a bootloader to load a kernel into it. But the, the Sci Fi guys actually put together the BBL, which is the Berkeley bootloader. And so you wrap your kernel with the BBL, and you feed this BBL kernel conglomerate into Spike and it boots and runs. Uh, and the BBL is also providing what's known as SBI, which is the System Binary Interface. You can think of it like a BIOS, right? I get git char and put char and some timers and some things I can call into the hardware for for free. And I don't have to know how it works because BBL handles all that for me, just like a BIOS would. Um, it also probes the hardware and actually tells you what you've got. So when it loads you, it gives you a pointer to a flattened device tree. And you can go get out of that device tree. Here's my memory. Here's where it starts. Here's the devices I have attached to me. Um, and you can do with that whatever you want. In my case, I just kind of throw it away right now because I haven't figured out all the FTT stuff. I know we have FTT in that BSD, but I haven't made it run yet. Um, but there's still a problem. We still need the actual RISC-V binaries. We've got to go build a BBL. We've got to go build an FBSD kernel with a RISC-V compiler. So at the time I started this, the entry compiler couldn't generate RISC-V code. <clears throat> and it actually wasn't a part of mainline GCC yet. So I took the Sci-5 tools from the RISC-V Foundation. Um, they have a collection of big utils and GCC and a couple other things. And I built that so that I could generate binaries. But I had to build two. One of them actually needs a C live, so you can actually build BBL, because BBL wants to do some basic screen manipulation and print some things out. So you need one that actually is linked against the C library, and one that doesn't have the C library, so that I can actually go build the kernel and not get all of the C library in my kernel. Because we have other standard functions to find the kernel. Uh, but these are all things you have to build. So, Building tool chains is complicated, and it takes a lot of work. And if you screw up the flags, you get to build it all over again. It's the uh, enjoy sample of my nightmare, right? Lots and lots of tweaking of like, OK, we can turn this one off. I can turn this one on. I need this one. I don't need this one. And eventually, you wind up with a working compiler after too much effort. But you can build something and actually load it. And you can print out Hello World and Spike, and it's glorious. But it takes far too much effort. Um, but now we have a working compiler, you've actually got to go try and build that BSD. And you're like, all right, I got this hello world. Now I want to actually go load a kernel. Um, well, we have this sweet build.sh script, which can help you with all these things and automate part of the process. Um, this basically wraps make files. So step one is to build make without using a make file, which is one of those mind blowing things of like, well, I guess you've got to start somewhere, right? Chicken the egg. I can't call make if I don't have make. So that works out pretty well. Um, they do a bunch of automatic detection behind the scenes to figure out what you're targeting, what you've told them about, what you're running on. And based on that, they actually go off and build a whole tool chain around that. Except that I have most of my tool chain, right? I have my own GCC. I have my own assembler. I have my own GDD. And everything else is coming from out of tree. So you have to go patch with a bunch of special flags. Um, and then go modify some make files because we actually didn't correctly support external tool chains when I started this. We actually needed to take a bunch of other options. And there was comments in the code of, we should do this. But then the code didn't do this. So that was actually my first contribution was, let's actually go do this thing that we said we're going to go do. So once you have that working, you can actually go run make and actually build a kernel. But of course, you now have a brand new GCC. It's angry about everything. Because your C code is not good enough C code. Right? You just get tons and tons of errors spit out, out of everything. Um, you can turn off W error, and you can keep on going down that path for a little while. Let's just make those warnings not errors temporarily. Keep trying to build stuff. All right. So once you actually manage to build something, you're still not done, right? I've got to go put it into BBL because I can't actually load anything. Only BBL can load something. So you go build BBL, you build your kernel, you link the kernel into BBL, and you have to do this every time you build a new kernel, right? Every time you compile a kernel, I have to go rebuild BBL and put the kernel inside it. And then I can go test it. 
So that very quickly found its way into my make scripts of like, this needs to be automated. When I run make and I build the kernel, we need to also build DBL and do everything else automatically. Because otherwise, it's just far too much effort. Um, and of course, you load BBL, and, uh, and it just you know, kind of dies. Because it's not done. But it compiled. So, step one. So, this was actually a port started by someone else. It was started by Matt Thomas in 2015. I decided I would pick up the pieces. This would be a fun graduate research project. I thought most of it was probably done. And I could come in and clean it up and make the whole thing work. Um, but it turns out the specs were very much a moving target, unfortunately. And they moved. It, it changed a lot. But in little ways, and things you don't immediately necessarily notice. And your tools don't even really help you out sometimes. Uh, so everything just sort of breaks, and in odd ways. So you're like, I know I did this correctly, but it's not working. And the example I have done here is svince.vm versus svince.vma. The old opcode was svince.vm, which would invalidate virtual memory when your page tables change. You can flush the, the MMU. The new one is svince.vma, and it can do everything the old one can do and more. I can now invalidate certain regions of virtual memory. And the assembler will happily generate the opcode for svince.vm. But Spike has been updated, and Spike gets real angry when you feed it opcodes you doesn't know about. And so Spike following the new standard, now the old one just immediately crashes. And not a crash in a fun way of like, I got an invalid opcode and I'm telling you about it, just of like, I'm going to core down. Good luck. And you're like, but I didn't do anything, right? I, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. The privilege spec is probably what changed the most, though. Um, page table entries were completely redone. So the way we're looking at virtual memory is completely different than the way we started off looking at virtual memory. Um, there's a new way of marking transient entries in the page tables, because RISC-V has what they call big pages. And I use quotes here because some people would argue it's not really big pages, because all pages are actually 4K. We can just refer to them in continuous groups. So as I traverse through the page table, I can just stop at any given point and be like, oh, the next contiguous block, that's all one page. It's fine. Um, privileges themselves are mapped completely differently. And the biggest thing was the control and status registers just split apart and moved all over the place. So every time you're really dependent on, is this bit set? Am I going to do the thing I actually intend to do? Well, it's not there. So you mask it off and you're like, I know this is what I should be looking for. Oh, it's not. It moved. It's in a completely different register now, which is also helpful when you context switch. You're not restoring the right registers anymore, because you're like, and restore all the status registers, make sure everything, oh no, everything's not OK. Um, one of the cool things, though, supervisor can't read the user memory by default, right? So when you're running up in kernel space, you can't just go read user level process. Kind of a neat security thing. Um, and meltdown's not currently a problem on RISC-V, which is just Fantastic for right now. So we're safe, fingers crossed. All right. So this all boils down to lowcore.s is just kind of garbage. Everything low level, as soon as the kernel gets loaded from BBL, is now trash. Right? Nothing is going to work. Virtual memories changed. All of my control registers and to turn things on and off are changed. Everything is just broken. So start over. Um, and I kind of started with virtual memory because I figured once I had VM up and running, I could do other things and I could start fixing other things. So RISC V actually has three specifications for virtual memory. We have SV32, SV39, and SV48. So it depends on how much you want to support and what your chip supports. And of course, you can query it at runtime. So you can ask it which one of these can you run. Um, and it kind of came across as like a Goldilocks and three bears of like, this one seems too small, this one seems too big, and this one seems just right. So we landed on SV39, which is also what FreeBSD and Linux is using. They're also using SV39 currently. Um, which that gives us three layers, like three layers of the page table. So we get 512 entries of one gig, 512 entries of two megabytes, and 512 entries of 4K. Right? We just keep splitting that page down and down and down. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier, you can just stop walking the page table. You can have a mark in the page table. 
and you can say the next contiguous block is all one page. So I can technically have a one gigabyte page. At the top level of my page table, I just marked it. And the next 512 two megabyte areas are guaranteed to be part of this thing. They're mapped out that way. So it's kind of neat. <coughs> we take full advantage of this, right? I map the kernel on two megabyte pages. It's one of those, well, hey, the kernel's a little more than eight megs. Let's just use as little space as possible. Let's make this easy. Let's map this all on two megabyte pages. So you can just keep jumping two megabytes at a time, map it all out, and everything's gold. And all you have to do is stick the one entry in the level one page table, which I just stuck way up top to make the map easy. Quickly glance at the screen and you'd be like, oh, I'm in kernel space, or I'm not in kernel space, right? Just kind of map it out. Um, and it didn't have to create any level three pages at all. And there's a downside to that, and that is that I totally wasted some memory there, right? If it's only slightly over eight megs, and I mapped out from the eight meg to the 10 meg space, there's some, some wasted memory that I can't reclaim. So I probably should go back and fix that, but other things first. All right, so you got a page table, you're done, right? It's built, it's all mapped out, your physical is, your virtual is, everything's golden. You load it up in this address translation and protection register, which is actually part of the supervisor working set, and you crash all over again. Right? This life would not be that easy. Anytime you write to this register, you cause a fault. Right? You're like, hey, I want to load virtual memory, or my virtual memory is changing. Fault. So if you haven't set up your fault handler yet, well, game over. The previous you guys had a pretty cool idea for this, though. And that is just load your current address, add four to it, set that as your fault handler. Congratulations, you're now running a virtual memory. And I'm like, well, I guess that works. That seems reasonable. It seems kind of hackish, but it, it totally works. Um, I got curious. I was like, what are these Linux people doing? What's the Linux way of handling this? And I can't say that I agree with the Linux way of handling this. The Linux way of handling this is, all right, we start, we build our page tables, we set our fault handler to start, and then we load our page tables into the address translation protection register. And then we fall back to start. And we run, and we create our page tables, and we load them, and we don't fall this time, because it didn't actually change. It's the same value as last time. <laughs> and so we keep going. I don't like, well, technically correct, but it seems kind of silly. So currently we're going the FreeBSD route of where am I plus one. Seems less bad. Um, there is actually a way to fix this. If you're running in machine mode, if you go modify the BBL, you can set a bit in the MTVEC register which says don't fault when the SATP register changes. But I have a feeling there are repercussions to this. I'm not entirely sure what they are just yet. There's got to be some reason those guys have that on by default. Um, but of course, now if you're running your virtual memory, you go spend about an hour and you run a console device driver because, hey, you really want to write something to the screen now, right? Let's go get printf doing something. Let's go debug actual things and not just dump registers out of a, a virtual memory machine. Right? Let's actually go see, let's print things easily. Um, I went to Linux Fest Northwest last year, and Michael Dexter gave a great talk about going to the BSDs. And he was super, super polite and said one nice thing about all the BSDs. He was on a whole slide for FreeBSD and a whole slide for OpenBSD, and our slide for NetBSD said they're very, very nice people. I'm like, that's true. I'm, I'm a nice person. And he said, but they, they spend far too much time working on their consoles. And I was like, that's not true. And then I wrote a console device driver, and I was like, he was absolutely right. We do spend too much time working on our consoles. <sighs> All right, so now you got VM. You have your PMAP, right? You got to keep mapping this stuff out. So PMAP is apparently the machine dependent portion of the virtual memory system from PMAP 9, our, our sweet man page there. Uh, it is fairly complex code. It's kind of nasty. Uh, I watched a presentation from the FreeBSD folks who said that it was absolutely the hardest part of the FreeBSD port for them. And it's one of those things that you just cannot screw up because bad things will happen down the line. Um, but a lot of machines do more or less the same task. There's just those weird little hardware quirks you have to do, right? So hey, 
Back in 2011, Matt Thomas, the same guy who started the risk that I for, well, I'm fairly certain he's not a real person. Uh, the gentleman up there tried to convince me he is real. I think this man is Santa Claus. I've never spoken to him. He just gives you presents, right? He gives you P. Matt Cowan. He gives you part of Risk 5. I've never talked to him, though. So again, Santa Claus theory. Um, came up with the idea of let's abstract this away a bit further. Let's handle all those common tasks in a machine independent way. And we'll just have hooks to call back into the hardware. So whenever you need to do something at a hardware level, you're like, oh, I need to go fix up the TLB, or I need to go manage the NMU. I'll have a little hardware, a little hook for that. And the hook will call the hardware, and I'm done. A really cool idea. Great for portability, which, hey, NPC is all about. Uh, and it's actually in use on a bunch of MIPS and PowerPC ports. Um, and they've actually started porting the ARM stuff to it as well. It's not quite done yet. So there's one small problem. Uh, it only works on platforms without hardware page games, which the risk plan has. So platforms like MIPS and PowerPC, where you can just inject a value into the TLB and be like, yes, this is, this is what you're looking up. I found it. You can easily manage NPMAP.com. However, if you need to actually go build hardware page tables because you're not allowed to talk to the TLB, it's not set up for that at all. So my work quickly became, all right, let's extend the map comment. Yes, sir. Sorry. Technically, the PowerPC doesn't have a max page table. It has, which is what you describe it, it has what's known as a, it might have a um, inverted page table. And I'm not going to try and uh, describe it because I have to read it back every time I look at it. <laughs> but basically, it's upside down. Hmm. I think it's important to throw it away if you guys are serious about that. That would be what I need to do. So, again, our final crash and burn, right? All of this effort, all of this progress, broken. But, we worked, we extended PMAP Common to actually support hardware page tables, right? A new set of helper functions hooked into the system. So all of your standard machine independent things are great, going along, going along. And finally, you hit this little sweet if death that says, if I have a hardware page table, let's go down this path instead. Let's actually go do the hardware thing the right way, which worked out pretty well. Um, there's a handful of checks that have to go into place where you can't rely on the hardware to do something because you need to do it before the hardware actually sees the results. Um, you get to use the permission bits for a couple extra things as well. But again, PMAP comments still can't do everything. Um, there's like PMAP bootstrap, which is like, let's set up PMAP. And you can't set up PMAP in a super generic way. And you have to have this hyper specific way for every platform you're bringing up. So I got to write PMAP bootstrap to tell PMAP, here's how you actually work. But once it goes, we got virtual memory, we got a console device driver, we got PMAP, I got a K thread pre, I got fork one running, and I got CPU to switch to. So at this point, the machine can actually start to run. Things print to the screen, it allocates memory, and then it wants that pesky root file system. But of course it runs that BSC. Right? Copyright prints, they allocate memory, things start up. And it just wants that darn file system. Here's where I hit a major snag. All of this was built with an out of tree tool chain that wasn't linked against our libc, wasn't linked against everything else. We actually need to build user land. So, stall. Here's where we stand right now. I joined the NetBSD project last month. I just got my commit bit. Very excited. Right? I'm going to actually get this all into the CBS tree and get it really going here. Um, Maya got user land built. So I'm actually going to be at the Hacker Lounge tonight to try and get this running the init process. Because it seems like we're about to make future progress here. Because the GCC just got pulled into the tree a couple months ago. So we're actually getting going again here. Um, and I really just needed some free time to sit down and make this happen. I did this all as a graduate research project. And then I graduated and I started teaching. And I learned that teachers don't have a life. They work seven days a week for no money. So I stopped teaching. I found another job that gives me weekends off so I can hack on fun stuff like that BSD again. So I'm really excited to actually get this stuff done now. Uh, so 
When we started this whole thing, TCC 7.3 was not a part of the CBS group, right? Couldn't actually build the RISC-V port from inside the tree directly. Uh, but Matthew Green did a bunch of effort, and he actually actually pulled the whole thing in. TCC 7.4 is in there, I believe, or even more up to date than this. Um, this lets us get rid of the external tool chain. We can actually build a root file system because we can build user land. And hey, who likes user land tools, right? I like user land tools. The kernel's fun and all, but doing real work's nice. And so, this actually just happened, right? We have GCC 7.3, and other people started actually working on this. And I need to stop slacking and get back to work. I've been busy with other stuff, and now I'm kind of excited to dig back in here and actually get the whole thing going. I'd also really like to get this thing running on QEMU. Seems like a lot of other people prefer QEMU at this point. When I started, I know there were some problems with QEMU in the RISC-V, um, but it seems like that's now the preferred way to go. I haven't heard much about Spike lately. I got a nice thumbs up there, so must be a good sign. Uh, and then also physical hardware. I actually bought one of the Sci Fi Hi Five Unleashed boards. It was sitting on my desk, and I had the great intention of I'm going to make this thing run. And then life happened, and I got busy. Uh, but that gives us access to real devices, right? There's Ethernet, and there's an SD card, and there's all sorts of other fun devices to attach to this thing, so you can go do real work. CDB. I like debuggers. They make life easier. I haven't quite figured this one out yet, though. Right? Stack traces in the risk file are kind of a weird thing. Uh, there's a return address register, and I was talking to you last night, sir. Uh, there's a weird way to make this whole thing work. Because if you call a function and then don't call another one, you never actually push your return address on the stack. It's hanging out in your return address register. Which is a cool optimization, but it seems yeah. difficult. What's that? It's just nuts all over again. Is it? Yeah. I'll have to read about more mixed in. Uh, so my current debugging is printf. Why is this broken? Let's print it out. I don't know why. Flat device free support. It'd be really great to actually get real data about the hardware we're running on. BBL actually runs and says, all right, here's what you have. Here's your memory. Here's your devices. Right now, I'm just like, hey, yeah, don't care. I've got a gig of memory, because that's what Spike gives you by default. I know that's not the right way, but I know we have FDT support, so one of these days I'll get around and actually parse that FDT tree. Seems fairly straightforward. SMP, right? Machines have all these extra cores now. I don't know what's up with that. Seems like we used to have one, and that's good enough. I guess if we have them, we might as well use them. Right? Uh, everything right now just kind of parks and sits idle, waiting for an interrupt that never comes. So. Could probably get the rest of these things spun up and actually talking to each other, but we need interprocess interrupts for that to actually make that work. And some more locking and some more fun things that I'm sure I've missed somewhere. But I probably want to get DDB working first. And then RB32 compatibility, right? If you've got a 32 bit version of your chip and you've got a 64 bit version, why can't a 64 bit version run 32 bit code? A 64 can do that. Um, as of, I think, November of last year, ARM64 can do that on FBSD. So it'd be kind of cool if we could go back and get some compatibility. And then I should really go back and clean up that memory thing, right? And there's some extra space that I wasted. And that's not hard. That's just stop mapping at 8 megs and go map the rest out on 4K pages. Just one of those. Yeah, yeah, I'll go back and fix it later. Let's go further. It'd be really cool to teach Malik about big pages. Be neat to give processes that are really memory hungry big pages and be like, yes, stop asking me. Leave me alone for a little bit. Here's two megs. Have fun. Or, here, Firefox, here's a gig. Have fun. Come back when you, when you run out. I think that'd be kind of a neat extension to go teach that about that, because the hardware can handle it. So, um, And actually moving to SV48. I don't think FreeBSD has made the move. I don't think Linux has made the move yet. But it seems like a cool idea, especially for address-based randomization, right? Now I've got even more space to go hide it. And it doesn't seem like it'd be that much effort to add an extra page for lookups. So maybe a kernel option to choose? We'll see. Hmm? Uh, the SD48, that's just the software fixed there? SD48 is a 48-bit page table. <coughs> so. If the hardware supports it, the software can make it. 
So the Hi5 Unleashed actually supports the SV48. So we could run that on the real hardware. Yes, sir. And the register that has the range table have bits at the bottom that tell you what format you're using. Yep. When you probe, is you like try to write with a bit of the type you want and see when you read it to work or not to find out which formats the thing supports. So you can actually have a kernel at runtime so like between the three. Yeah. <laughs> I think it may be like compile time kernel option. Let's just go down this code path instead. Let's start with, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Quick thanks to a handful of people. Phil Nelson, all right, NetBSD developer number six, my research advisor, all around awesome code. Super helpful when I had all of the dumb questions. Uh, Aaron Clausen, another professor at Western Washington where I went, who also listened to all of my dumb ideas. Nick Hudson, who really helped me with the PMAP common stuff when I got super lost because I never actually talked to Matt Thomas. Again, Santa Claus theory. He just produces code randomly, but doesn't actually talk to you. But Nick has apparently talked to Santa Claus, understands how some of Santa Claus's code works. Uh, and then Matt Thomas for actually starting you know, Common and the respect for it, because Santa Claus gave us presents. Any questions? Everybody's excited to go out and run this? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned you were having a fight with building NetBSD with an external compiler mm -hmm. to do user land, and the fix was to suck in a compiler. Mm -hmm. Would a better fix be to get user land building with an external compiler? Because the next guy, well, first, I suspect the comment you were reading may have been written by people doing the um, ARM64 stuff, because I've read some of the comments, mm -hmm. and it's referring to ARM64 compilers and not quite working. Mm. Um, that's a theory. I don't know if it's true, but... It's entirely it's just, possible. Um, the so big thing I hit when I was doing it were things like libbfd. So the tool chain, when it starts to build up, actually wants to access libbfd, and libbfd comes from Binutil, I believe. Yeah. Um, so you have to kind of go reach out of the tree and back up into your tree you built with your libbfd and not into the netbsd tree where it's expecting to find libbfd. Yeah, great can pick up the, possibly picked up the cross-compiled version. So I added flags. You can go set these these flags for make files now. And you can say, hey, bfd is over here. And I forget what the other one was. A couple flags I had to add um, just to get the kernel building. But to actually go forward with user land, I feel like there'd probably be more effort. I'm not entirely sure what. I didn't go super far down that path. So you know, the question is, would it be better to sort out user land so it doesn't assume it's an entry compiler? Mm -hmm. Really, what is in that compiler, that cross compiler that user land is assuming? Why is this hard? I think it's different reasons, but why should it be hard? Because the next guy that comes along to do another thought, he's going to hit exactly the same problem as you did, because the compiler will not be in the tree. Right. I mean, you could go poke around on the make files, and you could probably make it happen. I'm not entirely sure how much work or how much effort that would be to actually go down that path. My hunch is, if the code is made external only, mm -hmm. And it just so happens sometimes the external compiler is in the source tree. It will get simpler. Get so you could, you're saying like fake the external compiler to make it internal as part of the source tree? Yes. The big, thing, the big thing Bill.sh did is it said, let's suck this up and cross compile all way. It's kind of the next step. Well, Bill.sh is part of building it that is actually building the cross compiler. Yeah. Because that's one of the first steps it does after it builds make is all right, let's go off and use this make to go build things, <coughs> namely vintage tools and GCC. That's it. Actually, he looks to see whether he needs to. I mean, if you've already built the tool chains for the, the, the box that you're on, then you'll skip all that. That's true. Yeah, I was a bit surprised about that. I, I thought the external uh, tool chain stuff was being well sorted in that first thing. Wasn't well, it as it. easy as I hoped? No, it's completely different. It'll be a simple matter of I assume it's because they just keep pulling in GCC at some point, and then GCC supports everything. That seems to be the path. I don't know. As there's more compilers going forward, maybe we'll start to see other things, and maybe perhaps better external support. 
Um, I know at one point NetBSD was buildable with ICC, the Intel C compiler, and I know that wasn't a part of the NetBSD tree, so it had to have worked at some point. Sure. I think client's part of the tree. It is. So that's all in tree, so build.sh will just pick that up and run. You can't use that. Claim support for RISC-V 64-bit isn't finished. And when I started, it was nowhere near finished. Well, you know, I get nervous. Uh, my understanding is 32-bit's pretty solid right now. So if we wanted to go back and work on the 32-bit code base. I feel like somebody I work with might have I think he'd be able to build a world, maybe a kernel of 3DSD on the 64 hmm. I mean, he's hacking directly on LVM and claim bits for this fight. The guy who's maintaining most of that gave a talk, uh, I think the end of last year, beginning of this year. Alex? Uh, Bradbury or whatever? It seems right. Um, talking about how, why it's taking so long, and he's trying to get everything directly committed to the LVM folks, and he's doing it the right way, but it's taking time. And so I can appreciate that. But it would have been nice to just be like, hey, Clang, go fix my problems. I, well, anyway, GCC's been all right. It definitely got me ever going, right? Once I had the working GCC out of tree, and I had to build tools to accept that, it definitely got me most of the way there. So now that we have a new GCC in the tree, I'm excited to try and make everything else work here. So, Anybody else? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. But I think it'd be really cool to teach Malik behind the scenes. You've asked for this very large amount. I can map it out for you on these large pages already. Right, right. Because I mean, you, you tell Malik how much space you want, right? So but if behind the scenes you were just fixing things off and allocating large pages. Anybody else? All right, well, thanks everybody. It's been fun. Have a blast, have fun.